Hello, welcome to a new Endpoint webinar. I am Stormwind Studios instructor and Cybex author, William Panic. Thank you for joining me for a hour long webinar where we're gonna dive into and talk a little bit about some of the benefits and some of the changes that are coming down the road from Microsoft that more or less have to deal with Endpoint and how you're gonna be dealing with Azure and your clients. So thank you all for joining me for this hour. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you a little bit of an introduction of who I am and what we're gonna cover. We'll talk about why Endpoint is becoming such a large topic, especially in the certification world. We'll talk about the certification that comes along with this. And then we're gonna go through some of the benefits of using Endpoint. All right, and things like, you know, Intune inside of there. So let's start, though, by jumping on out. And I'll give you a little bit of an introduction of who I am and the class, the webinar you're about to watch. So basically, this is going to be on mastering endpoint security. I'm going to show you some of the security features that are built into endpoint that you can look at and you can use. Now, this is all going to be heading towards the brand new MD-102 exam, which is a brand new exam and certification that is coming down the road for Endpoint. I am going to be, if you decide that you want to sit through the MD-102 Endpoint course, I'm going to be your torturer during that class. My name is Will Panic. I am a senior instructor here at Stormwinds. I have been certified ever since NT351, so it's been a long time. I've been training for almost 25 years. I'm almost at my 25-year mark. But during that time, I worked as an IT member. I worked as an IT admin. And then for years, I worked as an IT director. So when I do my classes and I talk about security and Microsoft or hacking or whatever class that I'm basically teaching at the time, I bring a lot of real world into the class. It's great that we're going to help you pass the exam, which is a major goal for most everybody. But we also want to make sure that when you get back to work, you can achieve what you're supposed to achieve on the job. So I bring a lot of real world into my classes. I'm also a five-time Microsoft Worldwide MVP winner. This is an award that Microsoft gives out to people who excel in certain parts of the industry. Mine have all been in networking and security. And I'm also the same Will Panic that writes all of the Cybex study guides for John Wiley. All right, that's the publishing company. Cybex is owned by Wiley. So, so I'll be your instructor and your mentor through the MD-102 process. Now, why would you want to take MD-102? What's the advantages of taking that class and then taking the exam? Well, the first thing is any of you that were planning on looking at getting the client side certification, MD-100, MD-101, well, if you're still gonna plan on doing this, you're gonna to have to do it quickly. <laughs> All right, you're going to have to do it really quickly because Microsoft is retiring both MD100 and MD101 in July. So I believe the end date is at the end of June. If you don't have both exams passed at that point, you will not get the actual certification. So what is Microsoft doing to replace the MD100 and MD101 exams? All right, well, MD100 was basically the straight Windows 10, Windows 11 client exam. The whole exam was pretty much just working with clients. MD101 was the Azure side of it. Now that we have Windows 10, how do we connect those people to our, our Azure environment so that they can use Endpoint, Intune, and all the features that we're setting up in the cloud? So what Microsoft decided to do is instead of having two exams kind of breaking it all up, they're now going to do a single exam, MD-102, and that client exam is going to give you 
the actual certification that you're looking for. It covers pretty much the same stuff that MD100 and MD101 did. Except that they just kind of combined it together into one exam. Which, believe it or not, makes a lot more sense for all of you. For all of us that want to get certified. Because MD100 and MD101 were both on Windows 10 and 11. And MD101 focused also, obviously, a lot on Azure. But the two exams overlapped. A lot of the questions were exactly the same from one exam to the other. So Microsoft, instead of having two of them, decided that they would just combine them together, come up with MD-102, and when you pass this, you end up with your client certification. So this is a good way to go. And I kind of just wanted to show you, this is what Microsoft has put out, which is going to be on this certification in this exam. And you can see it all focuses basically on the client side. So it really hasn't changed much except for the endpoint part of the test. Now, the endpoint part is an excellent part to learn. So I can completely understand why they're changing everybody over to that. Because one of the things that endpoint can do for us, for the longest time when Microsoft put out the cloud, one of the key selling features, obviously besides the straightforward Office 365 or Microsoft 365 now, okay, and just having like Exchange and SQL and that stuff in Azure, those were great benefits. At the time, there was another component in Tune, and it allowed you to deploy and maintain your client systems from the Azure environment. Well, Microsoft actually rolled that now into Endpoint Manager. So there is still an Intune, but Intune is now part of Endpoint Manager, where Intune used to be the full, pretty much its own portal, its own app. Now it's Endpoint Manager and Intune is part of it. So the nice thing about that is Intune really was just a, like a client operating system, software deployment system, almost like System Center was on the networking side. But there were a lot of things that were lacking inside of Intune, especially when it came to security, on who could really, if you could really drill down and get very granular on which apps people could download, all right, which software they could use, which ones they couldn't use. So there were some gaps that made it a little bit more difficult for us to have full control over our deployments. So Microsoft introduced Endpoint. And what Endpoint really does is Endpoint takes Intune and all the benefits of Intune, but then it wraps around all of the other features that come along with Endpoint, including all of the security features. So what are some of the benefits and security features that you get with Endpoint. Well, first thing you'll notice is there's actually its own portal. So let me take you out. I happen to have Azure loaded up. This is one of our tenants that I use in the class. We have it set up. We have Azure Active Directory already set up. We already have our network set up. The two networks are communicating with each other, so we're good to go. So let's say, for example, that I wanted to click on security baselines. Now this is part of uh, the endpoint manager. It's part of the, you know, the Intune package. So when I click on it, it takes us to a brand new window and it tells us Intune is no longer available as its own portal, its own app. Intune is now part of Endpoint. So if you want to get to it, you got to go to the brand new Endpoint dashboard. And you got to re-log back in. So I'm currently logged in. So I'm going to just choose the same user. And it will log me in to Intune. Now this is Endpoint right here. So if I click on the home, I can click on the dashboard. And this actually is the same dashboard that I just showed you 
on the slide so you can go through and you can see which devices have been enrolled from your company. As people connect into the endpoint management, okay, and Intune, they have to enroll their devices so that they can access Microsoft 365 or any other apps or tools that you want them to be able to download. You can see from this if your computers are meeting all of their compliances. Now, this is a very, very good, very good thing because a lot of companies have to follow certain compliances. So if your company has to follow certain compliances and there has to be certain rules set up for your, for your users to make sure that they're meeting those compliances, you can set that all up right in Endpoint. You can see how the devices have been configured. All right, what apps people are using, what they're downloading. And over on the left-hand side, you can see that you even have a section here called Endpoint Security. And when you click on it, it opens up and allows you to start looking at all of the different components that we can add on top of Endpoint. And there are a lot of really, really good components here. That, listen, if you're, just so you understand something about Endpoint. Endpoint is not part of like the normal free Azure subscription. If you want to use Endpoint, you have to have one of the premium subscriptions. It doesn't come with the free subscription. So the free subscription is a great way to start getting in Azure, to start using some of the basics. But if you want to take it even further, you're going to have to get a paid subscription. Probably it's going to be a premium subscription and you'll end up getting Endpoint as part of the premium subscription. So if you are currently using Azure and you click on Intune and it tries to take you to the new Endpoint, if you can't get there, it could be one, you don't have the permissions, you don't have the right to go into the Endpoint portal, or two, you don't have Endpoint. So just make sure you remember, this is not something that automatically comes with Azure. It is an add-on that you have to purchase when you purchase your subscription. Most subscriptions come with it, but just make sure you keep that in the back of your mind. It may end up running you a little bit more money if you want to have some of these features. Okay, so, and by the way, uh, I just want to mention because a lot of people have been asking this, and we were talking about it before the before we started. This is all pointing towards a brand new class, MD102. And that's going to be a class that we are rolling out next month. So if you want to sit through the full MD102 class and learn the ins and outs about Endpoint and the clients, next month we'll be rolling out MD-102. We'll be debuting 102. So you can sit in that class and you can see the entire from beginning to end. All right. So uh, people have been asking that. So I just wanted to make sure that I let everybody know. All right. So while we're in endpoint security, let's just take a look at some of the little things that you can do. All right. You have the ability where you can actually set up antivirus for your users. Disk encryption if you want your users to actually have their disks encrypted, all right? You can set up your firewalls. Now, firewalls are one of the more important things that you definitely want to put into any network. And you probably are going to want to use more than just one firewall. Everybody is very familiar with setting up a firewall at the edge of their network. And it doesn't matter where this network is. All right, this can be on site or it can be in the cloud. When you build your network, it doesn't matter where the physical network resides. The physical network can reside in Azure or it can reside in your office on, on, on site. And then maybe you have a hybrid with the cloud. It doesn't matter. But the, one of the biggest components that we all use is firewalls. But besides the firewall at the entrance of your 
front door, more or less, to get into your network, you also want to make sure that you have firewalls inside of the organization, on the client machines. And that's one of the advantages with Endpoint. You can make sure that the clients have a firewall. You can make sure that the firewall is properly configured. This can be a saving grace by just having those internal firewalls running. People think that, hey, as long as I got, I just spent $50,000 on the best Cisco firewall in the world. Nobody's going to get through it. Why do I have to worry about the back end? So you can't look at it that way. Because it doesn't matter how good your firewall is. There's no such thing as a magic bullet to stop hackers. I'm in the middle of teaching the ethical hacking class right now. There, and I, that's one of the first things that I stress. There's no magic bullet to stop a hacker. There's nothing you can do to prevent a hacker. But there are a lot of things that you can do to make it a lot harder and a lot more difficult for them to get in and get information from your network. And one of those things is firewalls. And the great thing is because you're going to be using Endpoint Manager, you can manage all your users and you can manage your firewalls all from one location. So there's one other thing I, I just want to stress on right here. Attack surface reduction. You know, I have a lot of people that always ask me about this term and what it means in my classes. What actually is a reduced att attack surface? All right. The best example that I normally give when I talk about reducing the attack surface of any type of system, I always tell people, especially if you've been doing this long enough, Kind of think of it like this. The perfect example is Microsoft Server. When you go to set up your Windows Server, there are two ways that you really can set up a box. All right? And I'm not talking about like standard versus data center. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the addition. I'm talking about the way you actually set up the box. When you go to install your server, you can install the server where it has the full GUI desktop. And that's exactly what I'm showing you right here. This copy of server, if I minimize the internet, this copy of, of server has a full desktop. There is a second version of server that you can also install. It's called server core. Server core doesn't have a desktop. Server core, when you log into it, you go right to a command prompt. It's a very slimmed down version of Windows Server. You can't install all the same apps that you can on a regular Windows machine. So, the advantage to using a server core system is that you have a reduced attack surface. Because you can't load everything onto the actual server core system like you can on a desktop version, they call that having a reduced attack surface. There's less ways and less areas for a hacker to attack the box. And that's what they mean by attack surface. So the nice thing is you also get the advantages inside of Endpoint to where you can even set it up so that you can limit what's on the machines, what the desktop can do. You can help kind of close up some of the gaps so that the attack surface is much harder to, um, what's the best way I'm trying to look at for saying this? So it makes it the hardest for somebody to hack in. There's not as many vulnerabilities because there's not as many openings. Okay. So it's just one of those things that you get to choose. Do I want them to have the full system or do I want them to have a little bit slim back version? And because it's slim back, they're not going to be able to do as much with it. But then again, neither are hackers. So it's a decision that you got to make. Now, one of the things that you can do out on Endpoint, which is really, really cool, is you can actually set up 
what they call <laughs> Joe. No, you know, I was going to use the hockey analogy in my class. I kind of use an analogy on talking about a reduced attack surface because it's a hockey analogy. One of the things that I used to do, I used to live in New Jersey. I live up in New Hampshire. Everybody was talking about where they're from. I'm in New Hampshire. Originally, I'm from Jersey, and I'm a big New Jersey Devils fan. All right? One of the things that they used to do during the intermissions is they would bring out a piece of plexiglass and stick it in front of the net. And on the bottom, they had a tiny little opening that was just a little bit bigger than the puck. And they would let somebody shoot a puck at it from the center of the ice. And if it went through that tiny little opening, they would win a car or money or whatever the prize was. That is a perfect example of having a GUI version of server and a server core version. The wide open net is the desktop version. You can have the best goalie in the world, your firewall, and they'll stop most of the pucks that are shot at the net. But if a hacker's good enough, they're going to be able to score. But now think about being that goalie, your firewall, and all I have to do is now protect that tiny little opening. I don't need to protect the entire net. That is showing a reduced attack surface. I only have that little opening I now have to guard. And that's why I always use that analogy when we talk about it. So it really is... That's a perfect way to kind of look at it because it really is like putting a piece of plexiglass in front of a net. You're not going to get all of the same stuff with a server core system. And that's good and bad. It's good because it reduces the attack service. Makes it harder for a hacker to get in. But it's also bad because it makes it harder for us to manage and maintain the box. There's no desktop. So it's got its pros and cons. All right, so one of the things that you can do also while you're in an endpoint is you can set up endpoint baseline security. Now, baseline security, what it does is it makes it easy for you to deploy a Windows security baseline to help protect the users and devices inside of endpoint. Even though Windows and Windows servers are designed to be secure, many organizations, a lot of companies still want more granular control over the different security configuration options that they want to put into place. That was always kind of a, um, that was always kind of like a little bit of a gap inside of Azure. And, and, and Intune and Endpoint. You could secure Endpoint and Intune. Listen, by the way, a lot of times I still, and if you do this, it's okay. I mean, I do the same thing. A lot of times when I'm talking about Endpoint, I use the word Intune because Intune was originally the portal and it recently changed. So if you still kind of refer to it as Intune, most people are going to know what you're talking about. All right. But it is Endpoint. All right, so, but if you do say Intune, it's okay. So, one of the things that there was a little bit of a gap when we were using Intune or now Endpoint was you pretty much had to set up your security and then based on what group or what people you allowed to access a piece of software, they all followed that same security baseline that you set up. Kind of think of it like a security template. And you can assign different templates to different groups. But you really didn't have the ability, I mean, you unless you really wanted to make a whole bunch of baselines or a whole bunch of policies, excuse me, a whole bunch of policies, and then it just assigned different policies to different people. But that's a lot of work. So what Endpoint did is they put out Endpoint Baseline Security. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to use pre-configured Windows settings already in Endpoint that you can change and alter. But these settings allow you to get much more granular on what your users can do, how software can be deployed. So this is a very good component that's part of Endpoint. 
because it's going to help you set up your security to be as granular as you want it to be. Now, um, you know what? Daniel, if... Hold on. All right. So, Daniel, I'm sorry. He was just saying he was having trouble seeing the screen, so I just let him know to refresh. All right. So... All right, so when I first heard that Microsoft was putting out endpoint baselines, you know what's funny? I actually, the very first time I heard that, I kind of went back to any of us here that have set up baselines in the past. In the past, and this is where this can be a little confusing, and this is why I want to make sure I, I explain this. Because for a lot of us, setting up a baseline means something a little different than the way endpoint is actually using the word baseline. If I was going to build a brand new network or a new server, normally what I do is after I'm done building the server, and I don't care if the server is in Azure or in-house, it doesn't matter, all right? I sit down, I set up the operating system, I load the software that's going to be on that operating system, whatever it might be, Exchange, SQL, maybe it's a web server, who knows. But I load my software up, I get the box up and running, all the updates, and then what I do is when I put it online, for a week, I literally run Performance Monitor and I capture a week of information about that box. And then I take that information and just put it in the server room somewhere. Now, if a year later, I got to go back to that box and people are saying, hey, I think that server is running really, really slow. I could run Performance Monitor again on that box, take the actual readout, take the original readout, put them next to each other, and compare them and see, is the box actually running slower than when I first put it out there. Now, the problem is if you don't do a baseline, when you look at like performance monitor or any monitoring tool, when you look at the tool, if you don't have something to compare it to, you don't know if what you're looking at is the best the machine's ever run or the worst it's now currently running. So we would set up baseline so we had something to compare it to. That's not what this is about. So I want to just make sure I stress that because in IT, it can be a little confusing to people because we use the word baseline normally for something else. All right. So baseline security and endpoint are templates. It's not setting up something that you can compare it to down the road. It's just a template. And you can manipulate that template and based off of what you do, locks down what applications and what services people can use in Endpoint Manager. So it really is just another layer of protection against your software. Now, another thing that you can do inside of Endpoint while you're working on this is you can set up policies. And I actually specifically use the word Endpoint slash Intune. And there was a reason why I did that when I set this up. Because you can set up compliances inside of Endpoint, and then if you actually click on Intune, there's another area, again, where you can set up policies. So you can set them up from the Endpoint Manager, or you can set them up inside of Intune and set up policies for each individual piece of software you're deploying through Intune. So that's why I put it on the title of endpoint slash Intune policies. What these policies do for us is they're security policies. They allow us to manage the settings, the security settings on your devices, your client machines. Each endpoint security policy will allow you to support one or more different computer profiles. So if you have multiple profiles because you have multiple equipment, your one policy can support multiple computer profiles. 
security is always a concern. It's our number one concern today. So by being able to set up policies that you can make granular for each individual group or individual users, you can really limit what your end users are going to be able to do inside of Endpoint. How they can access software, what they can do with the software, how the software is configured when they download it. There's a lot of options that you have. And the great thing about the policies also is when you set these policies up, you can also set up notifications. And if there are devices out there that are logging into Endpoint and they don't meet the compliances that you've set up, you can be notified. So you might have to do something to that box. You might have to add something to the box so that it meets compliances. Or here's one of the things that this can be very useful for, especially in an environment where, let's say, like HIPAA. All right, like you're worried about HIPAA concerns, patient policy. If you're in an environment where you have to worry about security because there's like a, a government standard you have to follow. One of the things that you have a problem with is a lot of people use home PCs to connect back into work. And a lot of companies allow this, especially in the Azure environment. That's the real advantage of Azure compared to just setting up an on-site network. The biggest advantage truly is the licensing. You get 15 licenses for your endpoint Intune applications. So when someone downloads Office, they can download it 15 times legally. Now all 15 cannot be computers. You only get five for laptops and computers. You get five for, I believe it's like phones and then five for like tablets. And But you get a total of 15 licenses. So because you can legally download, let's just say Microsoft 365 to 15 different devices, your users can legally download Microsoft 365 to a home PC. That's one of the great advantages to using Azure. But... You don't know what they're doing with their home PC. You don't even know if their home PC has any antivirus. You don't know what websites they're visiting. So that's why these types of policies are so critical when you're going to use Endpoint. Because you want to make sure that you don't have people that are logging on with equipment that could actually end up causing your network to become virus infected. So you have a lot of control, granular control on how you set this up. And you can even take it a step further. You can also even set up conditional access. Now conditional access literally is a really fancy way of just saying rights. That's all it is. It's permissions. Do you have the right to access this application or not. That's all conditional access basically is. Now, conditional access has a little bit more granular settings than by just setting up read, write, full control, like a normal write you would give a folder. So for example, let's jump on our server for a second. If I wanted to, I could go out and let's just put something on the C drive. I can create a brand new folder. Let's just call it home for like home folders. And at that point, I can right click, go into the properties. I can share it. And then I can also set up my security. All right. What we're doing right here is setting up conditional access. We're going to state who has the right to access this folder or file. But here's the problem, okay? Here's the problem. That's all we can do. That's all we can do. We literally can just go into the security and say, I'm just gonna pick somebody, Adam. I, I can just go into the, literally just go into the permissions 
and add Adam or add a group that Adam belongs to. And that's it. If he has rights to this folder, he can access it. If he doesn't, then he can't. But that's pretty limited. It's either you have rights or you don't. And there's no other settings. With endpoint conditional access, that's changed. Not only can you literally just set up your normal permissions like you normally do. Inside of conditional access, you can even set up policies based off of where they're coming in from. Where they're located. Are they coming in from the company network or are they coming in from overseas? Because a lot of times if they're coming in from overseas, especially if you don't have clients overseas, it's probably a hacker because you probably don't have any users that work overseas. So you have a lot more flexibility with the conditional access inside of Endpoint than you ever do on your normal server. Now listen, before everybody starts posting up messages, I know that with your firewalls and that kind of stuff, you can put rules in to watch for IP addressing to make sure that like overseas addresses don't come in. But the thing is, you have to use your firewall to help you do it. With Endpoint, you can do it all from one location. So it really does make it much easier to configure and manage the rights that people have when accessing these apps and Endpoint. Now, I put a slide in here. I actually already talked about it, but I put a slide in anyway about the Endpoint firewall. All right. Listen, I want to give you a quick little demonstration of something. I read a, I, I, I always have to admit this because this is not my, this is not my example. I read an article years ago and they kind of, when they were talking about firewalls, they kind of took it a different way. And I just really liked the way they explained it. I thought it was a really cool explanation. So that's how, what I'm going to use. All right. When I talk about firewalls, I think the best way to really think of a firewall is think of it like this. Don't think of your network as a network. All right. I know that's a strange thing to say, but don't think of it as a network. I want you to think of your network as a nightclub. You have the hottest nightclub in America. Everybody wants to get into your club. Now, obviously, you're not going to be able to allow just anyone in. So we go out and we get the very best bouncer that we can put at our front door. And that bouncer has the list of who's allowed into the company and who are into our nightclub and who's not allowed into the nightclub. And this bouncer is the best in the world. Nobody's getting by the bouncer. So in this setup, why would you need any other firewalls? Well, the problem that we run into is end users. And this is nothing negative or mean about end users. All right. End users are not supposed to know computers as well as us. That's why we're IT and that's why they're doing something else for the company. We know it more. Unfortunately, when your users take their laptops home, you don't know what they're doing with them at home. And they may go out to a website and without knowing it, get something planted back on their box. And now when they come in and they plug in back at that nightclub, they don't even realize that they're opening up a back door to let everybody into the club. All right. <laughs> our brown our bouncer does not take bribes. Okay. So, because there's a possibility that the end user can open the door because of a hacker, you want to make sure that you have bouncers inside of your club. And that's the individual versions of your firewall on all your Windows clients. And it doesn't matter if they're working from home, it doesn't matter if they're working in an office, you want to make sure they have firewalls on their boxes. Because remember something really, really important. 
We are going into a brand new world. A world where our network can span anywhere because of the cloud. But that also means that if a hacker can hack onto my network and I have a connection point set between my network and the cloud, they're going to get to the cloud. They're going to go through the same gateway, whatever, however you set up that little connection. They're going to go through the same way as any other user. So now we have two networks we have to be concerned about. Not only do we have to be concerned about our on-site network, we also have to be concerned about Azure. And this is the reason why you want to put in as much protection as you can. You can never have enough firewalls. All right, you really can't. You should have firewalls sitting in the cloud, firewalls sitting in your company, and then obviously firewalls on all of the machines inside your company. Because the last thing you want is somebody to be able to have access to both networks. Okay. Now, does Defender, okay, or Endpoint, the question was, does Endpoint replace antivirus? All right, you know, that's a great question. Microsoft or Windows Defender does have antivirus in it, but... Let me put it to you like this, okay? Let me put it to you like this. I was, I've been an IT director. Before I came on with Stormwinds, I was an IT director for 14 years. I never used the Microsoft Firewall and the Microsoft Antivirus because we always purchased third-party software, you know, McAfee, Norton, whoever. I don't really care who it is. But we always purchase third-party software, and when we purchase that software, it came with a firewall and an antivirus. And that's what we would use. You, there's no reason to use Microsoft's firewall and a third-party firewall. I mean, you're really, at this point, on both on the same box. It's overkill. You only need one. So if you are using a third-party product, it's okay to stick with it. You don't have to get rid of it just because we're going to go to the cloud and we might get some firewall and antivirus protection through Endpoint. I still would not remove the third-party product. Microsoft's antivirus and their firewall is excellent. But let's be realistic. Is a Microsoft firewall as good as a Cisco firewall? Of course not. I mean, that's what Cisco specializes in. So, yes, you get these things with Microsoft. And if you're a company where you really have to watch your budget, then yes, all of these things can be done right through Endpoint. But if you have the budget, would I actually do it that way? I don't know. It would really have to depend on my company, the setup, and what I'm trying to achieve. But I don't know if I would, stric if I would stay strictly with just Microsoft. So I like using third party because think about it. I mean, Symantec, all right, McAfee, that's what these companies do. That's pretty much how they make their money. Microsoft doesn't make their money by building antivirus software. So the antivirus software you get on your box is going to be good, but is it going to be as good as something that you purchased? Probably not. Same as their firewall. So the point I'm just trying to make sure that I drive home, all of these security measures are there for you. And I would use them all. Use the endpoint firewall. Use the antivirus. Use everything that they give you. But I wouldn't 100% rely just on Azure. You got to make sure you still have all of the other components in place besides the free ones that you get by purchasing the endpoint subscription. Okay? So, it's probably the, you know, anybody who's been doing this long enough probably knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's good, but is it good enough when I put my entire security, all of my data, 
our lifeline in the hands of Microsoft antivirus, that would be a hard one for me to swallow by itself. Now, if I use that with other things that I had purchased, then okay, maybe. But just using Microsoft products only, I don't think that's the way I would go. But that's a decision that you're all going to have to sit down and think about and make. And one other thing, you know, one other thing I would definitely recommend. And it really doesn't have much to do with endpoint, but it has to do with basic networking. Listen, all of you, security is one of our number one concerns today. You see it every day on the news. Okay, 21-year-old kid takes classified documents and puts it onto a game server. All right, I mean, it happens. It happens every single day. All right, we are always under attack. We're, we have to watch our security. So the more that you can add, the more you can do, the better it's going to be. And because we have to worry about security so much, would I really just put all of my eggs into the Microsoft basket of security? No, I wouldn't. But again, that's something you have to decide. So Microsoft and Endpoint, you're going to get a lot of extra security that you normally would not get if you were just deploying the software from an in-house deployment server. You're going to get a lot more benefits in Azure and in Endpoint you're going to get a lot more security. You're going to get a lot more protection. But it doesn't mean that you cut out everything else that you're still doing. So just keep that always in the back of your mind. Okay? Every single thing that you can add to your network that makes your network harder to hack into is just going to be better for you. And just always keep that in the back of your mind. All right. So who are we? We are Stormwind Studios. We do online classes just like this webinar today. We have live classes and we also have classes on our campus that are recorded that you can go and watch anytime you want. We have, if you're looking to get certified or just learn about anything in IT, you can basically come to us and we're going to help you get certified. Our classes are all instructor-led. Again, we have live classes, and we do do have classes that are out there that are recorded based only so that you can go at any time. But most of the major classes and most of our major certifications, the classes are all live, and you're going to be, you'll have the chance to ask questions. It's an excellent way to go to class without physically going to class. You could sit in a pair of shorts on a hot day in air conditioning at home and watch our class live, ask questions, learn about it, and learn and get certified, and you don't even have to go anywhere. Now, if you would like to find out more about what we do and the classes that we offer, feel free. You can go out to our website, httppartners.stormwind.com. And then slash Microsoft dash next steps. And it'll show you the next steps that you can take so that you can continue on with your journey. Or you can contact Mike Fajan and you can get him at mike.fajan at stormwindlive.com or 480-339-2731. And let him know that you got all this information from Will Panic's webinar. All right? So... So if you want more information and you would like to find out more about us and the classes and what we offer, please feel free to reach out and we'll take excellent care of you. Listen, I want to take a moment and thank everybody for coming out on a Friday afternoon and spending an hour with me to just talk about what's coming down the road with Endpoint and the new MD-102. Hopefully, I will see all of you in our very first MD-102 class next month, and we can dive into all of these components as deep as we need to go so that you can learn everything you need to not only pass the exam, but also make sure that your network is set up the best way possible. 
Thank you for coming out. I am Stormwind Studios instructor and Cybex author, William Panic. I hope you have an absolutely terrific weekend, and I look forward to seeing all of you in one of my classes real soon. Thanks for coming out, everybody.